what a beautiful morning. The Grand Hotel, it belongs on the cover of Architectural Digest or Michigan History Magazine. No wonder it's been the spring media retreat for the Detroit Regional Chamber's annual Mackinac Policy Conference. What gets discussed, debated, and accomplished here has all the makings of one Michigan. It's Sunday, I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is a Spotlight on the News special. Where is Michigan in terms of education? We're not in a good place. Uh, I, I think we have to be very, very honest with ourselves that Michigan is underperforming uh, in terms of its uh, uh, education performance. Uh, frankly, at all levels, uh, even our most affluent, wealthy, uh, uh, heavily Caucasian districts across the state are underperforming their peer group across the country. In other states that have been doing the right thing around funding and systems and processes of accountability, even their most fragile students um, are doing better than our most privileged students in Michigan. Your contention now is we still are not in equitable funding. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, so what's happened is that the state will provide, for the most part, equitable funding, but the, what's creating the difference is property taxes. You give us $130 million a year, that's a, not one time, $130 million per year more, I can rapidly increase teacher salaries, I can fix our facility issues, but that's a, a, a clear discrepancy in funding that leads to inequitable outcomes and opportunities for children. Your concern on the west side of the state. So, one thing I like about what we do on the west side of the state, and it's the thing I'm going to talk about uh, during my session this afternoon, is that the idea of collaborative partnerships within education in terms of our community leaders, in terms of our business and industry leaders, all the way to our community-based organizations, philanthropy, all of us come together on a regular basis. It to takes say, a village, so to it speak. It certainly does. And when you find yourself at the place that we find ourselves at this crossroads in Michigan of seeing many of our scores in terms of reading, math, uh, among fourth and eighth grade um, students, when we see what those scores are looking like right now, um, I know very uh, uh, quite a few of our school principals and our superintendents in the Kent County and Ottawa County area, and they are just as concerned about it as anyone else is, but they are very open to those type of partnerships. When you start doing that kind of work, and now the whole idea that Associate Dean, he knows his job is twofold. One, get them in the door. Two, help them complete. Many people don't know, Chuck, that a program like construction management at Eastern Michigan is often the continuation of an associate degree in, in a skills tech area. So we'll have people that have worked in the industry come back to us to do a bachelor's degree because they want to take over the company or they want to do the next step in filling that skills gap for themselves and for others in their, their work unit. And we find that interesting. Engineering, we've launched two new engineering programs, mechanical and electrical. We think that fills that skills gap as well. And Sandy's right, we have failed all over the state in providing high quality K-12 education. The City of Detroit and many other members of this community um, and Bank of America will put about 8,000 young people to work. That's a lot of young people. A lot yeah. of young people that will have... But it's their start. It's, it's their just, start. They're going to be running this place That's pretty right. soon. Yeah. When Spotlight returns, how do we economically grow the state of Michigan? We'll be right back. Next, uh, we have Grow Michigan, focused on economic development and entrepreneurship. We need to make sure we have a diverse mix of business that's here, but also other businesses to support our growing corporations and to feed those entrepreneurs who are bringing innovative and new technology to our state. We loaned out to 32 companies over $57 million. That's a and, lot of dough. And leveraged over $320 million for senior lenders at the same time. So when a senior lender is trying to make a loan to a middle market company in Michigan and they can't quite get there with the collateral, Grow Michigan will step in, provide capital interest only to help protect or create jobs in Michigan. 
This started under the Snyder administration. It did. Uh, it's, we now have a new administration in. Is this administration equally supportive? Very supportive. So Grow Michigan 2, which won't get started until probably 2020, uh, is supported, has already been approved by the current administration. We started way back in 1995 with a single fund, and that fund's purpose was to invest in the city, generate a nominal return for its investors, but to advance economic development in some way. So we focus on women, Detroit-based immigrant uh, you know, companies, uh, and uh, have been doing that since our inception. Uh, in minority companies, uh, obviously, as well. 53% of the companies that we've invested in, when we've invested in 115 companies at this point, a lot of uh, you know, uh, can check at least one of those boxes. So we're real proud of that. We have a meeting with African-American business owners up here every year. And in that meeting, we talk about the challenges uh, that we face, and in that room, there are billion dollar auto suppliers and there are startup staffing companies um, all trying to grow their business and support their staff and allow their team members to feed their families, etc. But Chuck Detroit's 139 square miles. Yeah. There's a lot of people in the neighborhoods that want new housing, they want service businesses, they want hospitality. So there's a tremendous opportunity for people to go outside of the 7.2 square miles that people talk about and go and invest in other parts of the city. DTE Energy uh, Foundation invests about 18 to 19 million dollars in the state per year with nonprofit partners. And we have six key giving areas. We invest in arts and culture. We invest in basic human needs. We invest in community transformation in specific neighborhoods. We clearly invest in our environment, air, land, water, and wildlife. Mm -hmm. Education and employment is our, our largest investment strategy. And then um, kind of the underpinning for the state is economic progress. There are a lot of great nonprofits that help with retaining, recruiting, and expanding business in, in our state. Self-driving cars will be uh, equally as, uh, as transformative. And my goal is to make sure that happens in Michigan, that we continue to be the center for the auto industry as the auto industry transitions into really a mobility uh, industry. And that's something that we have to, to do uh, in, a, in a bipartisan way. So I care very deeply about transit and transportation. As someone who was a transit rider, as someone who did not drive a car in Detroit for almost three years with my family after coming home, I care very deeply about having equitable, affordable, fast and safe transportation um, through, high, through public transit options available to people in communities across the state, specifically in the southeastern Michigan region. So that's one piece. The second is connecting our communities by connecting people to broadband internet access. Too many people in the state of Michigan do not have full access to internet, the broadband internet, at home. The third, and the one that I've been doing the most on thus far, is on criminal justice reform. So I'm proud to co-chair Task Force on Pre-Child Incarceration with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice McCormack. We're working to look, in, look at the most comprehensive analysis of the county jail system in the history of the state of Michigan. That's Coming up, sustainability, stewardship, and loving our beautiful Michigan. Republican legislature, Democratic governor, but you got it done. Well, I think the people of our state had spoken very loud and clear in telling us that they were fed up with paying the highest car insurance rates in the country and not being given a choice of their level of coverage. And in an era of divided government, we understand that there needs to be consensus and we need to be at the table to put politics aside. Can you say it's some relief, it's a good start, but we still got to continue to work on it? But let me make this very clear. This was not a bill to make the lobbyists happy. And many of those talking heads are stakeholders who have built their system around car insurance for the past 30 years. This was a great win, and I look forward to building off of this into the coming months. Does this open up the door to do what the governor has said has been her number one priority, and that is fix Michigan's roads and bridges? We have built a great foundation of trust in this first five months with tackling car insurance, and I hope that carries over as we begin to talk about budget uh, continue to talk criminal justice reform, continue to talk about closing the, the, the skills gap uh, in our state, 
and there's a lot of issues that are facing our state that we can use this momentum on to really build off. Can you swallow the governor's 45 cents gas tax hike in order to get those roads fixed? I don't think the people of our state can swallow a 45 cent gas tax So hike. what's the magic number for you and Majority Leader Shirt. Well, I think it's short-sighted to only think of gas tax, right? There's many ways that you fund our roads, and I will tell you this. Before I talk about new revenue, I first need to ensure that every penny that's paid at the pump in taxes goes towards roads. And we're going to get a budget to the governor that's done in a responsible way. So this is an issue that has vexed us as a state for five years. We got something done in the first five months, and I think it's because we really have prioritized opening up dialogue between the quadrant. We've done meetings every other week. Sometimes they're very superficial, other times they're really substantive, but mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is, you're not talking to one another, you're never gonna be able to find common ground. Is the product perfect? No, of course not. But and and you admit that, that, yeah. that this is not perfect legislation. But I think we're taking a big step forward, yeah. and as we get data in, we're gonna be able to assess and make changes along the way that are necessary. Are you saying to them, okay guys, uh, I play ball with you, now it's time for you to play ball with me. Absolutely, and in every conversation we had, it included the budget and it included a real road fix. So we've been talking about it all along. I think we're going to make some good progress and surprise people. They're looking for cuts. Where are you prepared to give them some cuts in what you already have? The Michigan Chamber of Commerce said there's no such thing as fairy dust to fix roads. If after eight years of the Snyder administration, they couldn't figure out where to find money in the current state budget to fix the problem, it's not there. And that's why we've got to raise revenue to fix the roads. How much time are you going to give the governor in this state before you take action? Well, you know, the governor and I have talked about this extensively, and she's been negotiating with Enbridge for quite some time at you this point. You want to give her space to negotiate? I do, I How do. How much space? Well, I know she's been talking to them for the last, I want to say, five or six weeks. Um, and I'm, you know, fine giving her a little bit more time, but not much more time, because my position is that every single day that Line 5 is continue, continuing to operate is a day that our state is facing uh, significant peril. And our state simply cannot afford to see a rupture or a spill, the likes of which could possibly be the biggest um, oil spill in American history. I mean, it could possibly be that bad. I absolutely want to see the governor be successful in her effort to negotiate with Enbridge to get them to shut it down on their own. But if they don't, uh, certainly I plan to take action. I have every confidence in my team of attorneys that this will be litigated properly. Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel told me yesterday she's giving you and Enbridge about five to six weeks to come up with a solution for the Line 5 pipeline. Is that enough time to reach a resolution? Well, let's be clear, she's not giving me time. She is but she's, has her own she's, independent authority that she can use. I've right. asked her But she's threatening to, the hammer and to she's give us rooting the for your to success. See if we can get it done. And okay. I'm trying to be successful as well and it's good for everyone if we are. But Dana and I share the goal of protecting the Great Lakes and getting the oil out of the water. If I can get it done by a date certain and, and ensure that there's continuous supply of energy to the UP, that's my duty as governor. If not, then we'll, then we'll have to go to court, and that's what she's getting ready to do. Are your negotiations going well with Enbridge? Are you close? There's an open line of dialogue, but I need a date certain, and that's where we are um, continuing our energy to get that done. But all of the underground infrastructure is just as antiquated, if not more so, from an infrastructure standpoint. And so I'm just trying to raise everybody's awareness. As you say, the person at home, all of a sudden their underground interceptor collapses or their sewers are not working, and they have a real issue there. So we do have to think about investing in underground infrastructure as well. And one other part of that is something I'm totally focused on, is how we can stop combined sewer overflows from going and discharging into our lakes. In our case, Macomb County into Lake St. Clair. It's been going on for decades and decades, generations, and you know what? You can't keep doing it. So we have a $30 million project that's underway right now. We're in the process of designing it. We intend to start construction next year. When we're complete with that, we will have eliminated the discharges from our big pump station by 80%, by 80%, which is enormous progress, but it's expensive. Infrastructure is not a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. And really, when we talk about the, the amount of issues that we have with infrastructure, we can't resolve them without having federal assistance. So somehow, 
somehow the administration has to work with the House and the Senate and get a national infrastructure bill. Senator, every year you guys have put together a bipartisan tour. What's right. on tap for this year? This year we're going to Illinois to the spot where we believe if we focus, we can actually stop Asian carp from coming into the Great Lakes. 40 miles south of Chicago, there's a spot called Brandon Road Lock and Dam, and all the rivers come together at that point. It's a choke point. So what we're doing is going over there July 1, and we're going to be meeting with the Army Corps. We're going to be meeting with folks from Illinois as well as Michigan and uh, going through what they recommended. But these fish aren't waiting for reports. I keep telling the Army Corps, sure. you know, these fish keep swimming no matter what. Madam Secretary, yes. uh, saw a release this morning that you're going to try to make it so that you can have appointments. Yes at all of the Secretary of State's office. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How's that going to work? Because I know you went to visit all of them. Yes, I did. And the one thing I saw is that in the offices where you were able to make an appointment ahead of time, that significantly increased people's good experiences and it got people in and out in 30 minutes or less. Because you just show up and you're seen right away. So we wanted to make those more available to more citizens and we were starting by expanding them to every office. So. That should make it so that when you walk into a Secretary of State's office, you got an appointment. Yeah. If you're on time, yeah. you should be in and out of Just there like 30 office. minutes at yep. the most. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I no say more so. of these long lines. Right. Well, and, and hopefully that, that minimizes the number of people who show up and just get in line. So we have less less of a wait. So you and don't more have to make an appointment, but you'd be Correct. wise to make an appointment. I think so. That's what I tell everyone. Up next, the search for political civility and the Chamber's to do list for next year. If we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. Essentially saying Mueller said, Congress, here's the information, now do your job. Well, I don't think, I don't think Bob Mueller was telling it just to the Democrats. I, was tell, I think he was communicating directly to Republicans and Democrats, which is, is that if you think the president should be held accountable, then both of you do your job in this. We do have one Republican congressman from Western Michigan from yes. Grand Rapids who came up and said the Congress should begin impeachment hearings based upon what he's read. And he quickly got a challenge. Too, yeah, he quickly got a challenge and he quickly got support pulled from him by, by traditional Republicans. I, I think where we are is, is I think that's what has to happen. If that's what they want to do, they have to hold the president accountable. And I think it's, it's incumbent upon both parties to answer that question. And they, in the end, as I said um, earlier at a speech, um, it's, you have to put country over party and make that decision about what's in the best interest and how you hold the president accountable. I think the Congress has ceded their power to the executive branch way too much over the last 30 or 40 years. Where would you say America as a whole is right now? I think we're in a really crucial moment that has happened in our history three or four times. I think we're as in a crucial moment in America today as we were back in the Great Depression and in World War II when everything was changing. I think as, as we were back in the Civil War and the Industrial Revolution. I think we're in that moment today. Disruption has happened. People are fearful of change, what it's going to mean for their lives economically, politically. How they What is the American story? I think people now have some, have some ac acquiescence about what actually is the American story. And so I think we're in one of the key moments in our history, and I think this 2020 election is going to really try to answer the question, who are we as Americans? If you had a message and advice to the president, what would it be? I know that you've been in the Oval Office with him. Uh, what did you say to him, if you can tell us? Uh, I can. I, I, I said to him, it was the day I met with him the day of his um, State of the Union address a year here and three months ago. He has to unite the country. And he, I told him, I said, you got to stop speaking to 40% of the country or one third of the country and you got to speak to all Americans and figure out a way to unite us because what's presenting, what's preventing us from getting anything done on all the big issues is the fact that we're so divided. And so if I had one piece of advice is figure out a way that you speak, say and do, what you say and do unites the country. Part of the problem is he's got a lot of people around him in the White House that don't encourage him to speak to a broader part of the country. And any final message for your beloved state of Michigan where you're born and raised? 
Um, just keep doing what they're doing. I mean, things are going great here, I think. I think people are looking at it. I, I view Michigan as one of those places that in the next decade or two, there's going to be a reverse migration back to places like Michigan. So it's a great state. Love it here. Um, just keep doing what you do. All right, we'll welcome you back from Austin. Uh, I, uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks. Matt, thank always you. good talking thank to you. Thank you. This is our largest customer, and, uh, and arguably uh, we, do, we do everything we can possibly do over these next three days for, for our guests for this conference. And it, it forces us to get to our A game in the beginning of the season. It brings you, the media here, it gets the word out about Mac and Island and Grand Hotel, and it, it's just really a godsend for Grand Hotel, but also Mac and Island. Patty Poppy wrapped up the Mackinac Conference, your year as chair. Did it meet your expectations and did you reach the goals you set out at the beginning? You know, I think yes and then some. Uh, we hoped to demonstrate that while the rest of the world is more divided than ever, here in Michigan, we are united. That's and why you wanted that one that Michigan One thing. Michigan. Like, we can come together. And with two parties in power, you know, shared power between the Democrats and the Republicans, that that can be a source of strength, not a source of weakness. That just like all things, Michiganders, when we uh, put it to our mind to get it done, we can get a lot done. And so. Getting that uh, bill signed into law right here on the porch uh, was a pretty nice feather in the cap of the, uh, of the conference, but really it was a testimonial to the quality leadership we have in this state. Now have your 2019 to-do list. Why is that important and was it hard to come up yeah. with the, that to-do list? You know, first of all, um, it would be a real failure to have the kind of quality of conversations we've had here and then just go back down state like nothing ever happened. So we've got to hold ourselves as a chamber accountable to delivering on the key efforts of the conference. We had three pillars for this conference under that one Michigan umbrella. Right. Prepare Michigan about education, grow Michigan about entrepreneurship and business growth and health, and then love Michigan. And so we've got some uh, strong to-dos around the, the, our Mish Auto program and how to learn more about what are their limits to growth. We're really going to take a stand on this texting legislation. We at the chamber can be a, a force for good on, on things like that and the Census 2020 you're going to see in the to-do list. You know, there are some things that we feel like the chamber is uniquely positioned to continue to convene under this umbrella of One Michigan, that together we're stronger. Let's stay united in spite of our um, uh, diversity of thought. It actually is our strength, not our weakness. And the chamber is uniquely positioned to really continue to lead that through the to-do list. Uh, Mark Davidoff told me, the best words to ever hear is past cheer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you starting to feel like that now? Well, you know, now the work starts because the chair of the conference becomes the chair of the board of the chamber. That's true. You now got I got to deliver that to-do list. You got year to go. Yeah, I got some work to do. One strong Michigan. That's what everyone wants. Reporting from the very historic Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island, I'm Chuck Stokes. Thank you for being with us.